welcome to the Make Shit Happen podcast. If you're a business owner or aspiring entrepreneur who is ready to learn how to stop procrastinating and take massive action to start turning your passion into profit today, you're in the right place. I'm your host, Sam McLeod, real estate expert, six-figure coach, and champion athlete. And my goal is to equip you with the exact tools and steps to create massive success today. Let's dive in. Welcome, everybody, to episode number one of Make Shit Happen. This podcast today is with our guest, the one and only Ian Jacobs. Um, For those of you that don't know Ian Jacobs, Ian was born in 1970. He's an undisputed three-time world champion kickboxer, Thai boxing world champion, WKA champion, intercontinental WKA champion, world ISKA champion, 10 times state, national, and international titles. Ian Jacobs also holds the world's fastest record at 1.8 seconds and was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1996. The IK Hall of Fame 2008, ISKA Hall of Fame 2013, Queensland Muay Thai Hall of Fame. Ian Jacobs holds national and international world titles and is regarded as one of Australia's most infamous but also famous world champions to ever do it. Ian is also the founder and creator of his new combat sport, Thunderball, and became a multimillionaire before the age of 30. Ian, just want to give you a warm welcome. Thanks, That mate. was a lot to digest, but um, <laughs> thank you for coming on to the episode. Yeah, thank you, mate. Mate, I've got to ask you, a lot of people um, straight off the bat were wanting to know, um, how did you get into kickboxing? How did you get into combat well, sports? And more importantly, why did you want to do it? Mate, it, it, it goes back to being a child. Like I remember being five months old and I, I was born with a gift and I felt this power and I always knew it, you know, and and it started at the age of four. So it's showing my age here, you know. Um, <laughs> so Muhammad Ali on a black and white TV, yeah. champion of the world. And I resonated with that. I wasn't a normal kid. I had a six-pack at four jumping off the roof, but, you know, like just a, a mum's worst nightmare kind of kid. Crazy. Yeah, but um, I, I resonated with that. And, I, and and But what really got me is I, I knew he was doing something good for the world. And the first time, because I used to, I was watching, it was, you know, all the time. And then mm. I watched him drive up this driveway, get out of his car, and there's a big mansion house. And he goes, this is my parents' house. They never have to worry about for another thing for the days they live. And I knew my mum and dad were doing, you know, two, three jobs. I knew we weren't. And I wanted to, I wanted to be world champion, do something good for the world. And I knew that to do that, to have the voice, I had to be world champion. Mm. My parents weren't rich. We weren't on TV. And I knew that that's what I wanted to do. That's where the desire started. But it was when I was six when I knew. I first knew I wanted to be champion of the world. Four when I wanted to be and desired it, but six when I knew. We were travelling from Melbourne to Brisbane. We were moving. I was in the back of a GDS Monaro. Dad dad waited six months off the production line. And um, my brothers and sisters are in another car. And in between that period, my mum was like, you're not going to be a fighter. Dad's an ex-part-time commando and a bit tough and she didn't want us to have anything to do with that kind of thing. But um, she's just trying to deter me. In the back of the GDS, when I remember Muhammad Ali song come on the radio, I had this tingle through my body. I knew then I'm going to be champion of the world. And I've turned around, I had to tell mum, I love my mum. And I've gone, mum, I'm going to be champion of the world one day. And she goes, no, you're bloody not. <laughs> and we went and it's the back. And I said, and I just knew, and I had to tell her, mum, I'm going to be champion of the world. And she leant back and goes, smack, gave me a blood nose. <laughs> she goes, that was your first? Feel- yeah, that's right. She first goes, I like the feeling nose. of that. That's what it'll feel like. Thanks, but mom. a fireball went off in my stomach by the power of the sun for two days all the way to Brisbane. I have not said one word. And I, on my head, I'm just going, I'm going to be champion of the world. I'm going to be champion of the world. I'm going to be champion of the world. The weirdest thing was, yeah, well, you've seen Rocky, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Everyone's one of like, my favourite movies. Yeah, well, when I was 10, I didn't just – and this is one of the biggest things with business. Actually, I'll rewind a little bit. One of the biggest things is, like, my mum gave me a blood nose, okay? Like, you, everyone can make excuses why they don't do anything. But sometimes those moments that – could almost crush something are your, your greatest asset when you stay true to it, you know what I mean? Because I desired it. The secret is you can want to win, you can need to win or succeed. It's when you desire that when the magic happens. And I desired to be world champion and I knew I would. Do you bridge that with focus? With Oh, well, it's something, it's deeper than just focus, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, see, you, you say, say, for example, if someone wants to get fit, they seen something on TV. If they need to, they're getting married or something. If you desire it to get fit, that's when the magic happens. All right, that's when you dedicate yourself. So in business, picking something or in life, picking something that you love, that you desire, 
that's if you find something like that, that's the one you can go for mm. and you'll succeed more than anything else. You know, if I have to make money, so I'm doing this job. If I need to make, I want to make money, so I'm doing this job. It's when I desire this job or I desire this lifestyle or I desire this sport. I want to be, you know, world champion. You desire it. That's when the magic really happens. So it's, it's like desiring as, as badly as you want to breathe. Uh, yeah, yeah, everything. You know, you sleep it, you eat it, you, you, everything about it. You yeah. love it, you hate it, everything, you know, it's like that. And um, I was 20, like the rock, I'll, I'll go back to the, the, the Rocky thing, right? When I saw that, I was 10. Again, I didn't just see that or want that. I desired it. And the funny thing was I was 24 when I got a crack at my first world title fight. And exactly. 20, 24 you had your first crack at a world title fight. Yeah, and it was. Wow. Four times world champion Cash Gill couldn't find Ange Gooses from Melbourne. Ange Gooses got sick. He got pulled out five weeks before exactly like Rocky. They rung me up. Do you want to fight it? So I'm like, wow, crazy. On my mum's 50th birthday, you know wow. what I mean? So I could afford Mike Tyson. Five weeks training. You need five months at least, you know what I mean, properly to properly prepare for a fight like that. But anyway, fifth round, I've knocked him out. As the referee's gone, that's it, and wiped his hands out. As my hands went up, my, it just slowed down. My life flashed in front of me backwards every training millisecond and I was a six-year-old kid standing in the ring with my hands up the day I said I knew I'd be world champion. You know wow. what I mean? It was like it's the most, one of the most euphoric things ever. You know, so yeah, that was one. Yeah, that's crazy. And I remember um, one of the fights that you told me about when we first started training. So for everyone listening that doesn't know, um, Ian is my, my current boxing trainer. He's been teaching me yeah. for a little over a year, just about a year or just over a year now. Yeah. Um, and when I was training with you one time, you brought up this story about how you fought Bruce Lee's mentee. Yeah. yeah. Tell, tell the people, that, 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 oh, well, this well, is I'll, crazy. I'll go through the journey for you if you like. It's yeah. a little bit out of the go. The next world title fight, and, and it's a few, the reasons why I'll do that is there's a lot of things that have happened in my life in fighting that I recognize that, mm. that, that um, correlate with business. So my second world title fight, I'm, uh, I'm fighting Sam Solomon, mm. uh, the Egyptian guy from Melbourne. That's anyway, he, on my way to the ring, I'm the most focused fighter you can ever see. You know, you cannot get in my headspace. I'm just so headstrong, right? Mm. Going to the ring, but my masseur is beside me and he's like my brother, massaging me every day. He's in my corner, one of my training partners. Anyway, he slaps me on the back and goes, break a leg, mate. And I've never heard the saying. <laughs> And I stopped, I stopped four times on the way to the ring. And I'm like, what the fuck would you say that for? Excuse my French, everybody, but just making it real. And, um, and he's, uh, he's trying to tell me it means good luck. And like totally in my head, what do I do in the first round? I snap my leg. Oh, really? First round, snap my Jesus. leg. And uh, I've just turned around, do a thing called body trance where you make your whole body one muscle and I've just gone, nah, that's it. And I won the fight. So oh, that's shit. the second world title fight. But what I'm going, what I'm going to relate that to businesses is you've got to be extremely powerful, the power of the mind, the thought. Do you know what I mean? Like that's totally happened because he said it. I love him. I've taken it in and, I, and I've done it. It's happened. It's no, no, without a doubt, you know what I mean? Like that, that's the sort of stuff that happens so often. But this is the thing, right? Like you, you talk about, you know, breaking a leg, like it's, you know, going for a Sunday stroll, you got up and you won the fight. Like for people that are listening, some of these people have never even been hit in the face. They've yeah. never experienced a fight before. So. Yeah. How would you best describe that feeling of when you broke your leg and then you're getting up and you're still going back into the fight well, saying, I want more? Yeah, well, it's a little bit different. Like I said, I chose this as, the, as my purpose in life. And I, and, and I swear, like I've always said it, I, I prepare to die to win. Yep. So breaking an arm and a leg and stuff like that mm. is not, you know, if you're really prepared to, you, you, you go through that. When you make a choice in life, you got to, like I said, devote, dedicate, devote yourself to the yep. desire and the devotion has to be 100%. Mm. And that's what the sport takes. You know what I mean? You, you win or you lose as a fighter. There's no second place. Mm. There's no excuses. You know what I mean? So that's what I chose to do. And, and you've got to mentally, physically, emotionally, and, and your soul's got to commit to that 100%. Mm. And that's another one of the secrets to success, you know? And so then, then my third world title fight, which is... <laughs> so I've, I've promised uh, an old guy, Tarek Solik, number one promoter in the world, afterwards, but at this time is like Australia International. I've promised him I wouldn't hurt myself in this fight because we got Australia's number one grudge match. I'm fighting a guy called Gherkin Ozkan. I think it was 54 fights, 49 knockouts, 39 in the first round. He was like the Mike Tyson of fighting. Shit. And um, I promised him we're meant to be fighting him four weeks later. I've done the fight. My masseur is trying to tell me I've broke my leg. I said, I haven't broken my leg, mate. 
Anyway, so I've gone out that night to celebrate, had a few drinks, trying to dance on one <laughs> leg. On the town. Gone to the doctor the next day with my, my you know, calf as big as my thighs and, and all black. And they've gone, yeah, you're breaking your leg. And I said, I haven't broken my leg. Can you break your leg? And I'm thinking, I promise this, you know, Turkish super promoter, mafia kind of Don King kind of guy, one of my good friends that I, that I wouldn't hurt myself. So anyway, so he's rung me. He said, how'd the fight go? I said, yeah, one. He goes, how'd you go? You haven't hurt yourself? I said, I broke my leg. He goes, tell me you didn't break your leg. I said, I broke my leg. He goes, I'll see you soon. I said, what do you mean? He goes, I'll see you soon. Hung the phone up. I was like, oh, what does that mean? He's jumped in his He's car. He's rolling up. He's jumped in his car and driven from Melbourne to Brisbane. Not a good sign when a mafia guy <laughs> jumps in his car and drives and doesn't get on a plane, you know what I mean? No. Anyway, he's put a contract in front of me. He goes, when can you fight? So I said, eight weeks later. Give me eight weeks. So five weeks I'm training with one leg in the air. <laughs> Three weeks before a fight, I put my leg down. I can start moving around. But it gets it gets even more interesting because um, I'm fighting this this Turkish guy that there's, I mean, like the hardest fight of my life, that without a doubt. And half because of how tough he is and half because of the situation. First round, I've broken my other patella. I've broken my sternum. He's punched me. I've never been never been dropped. And I'm blind in one eye. And, what do you um, mean blind in one eye? Couldn't see. Completely black. You couldn't gone, see. Temporarily blind. Yeah. You could not see. Could not see out of one eye. Gone. Jesus Christ. And there's a photo I'll give you you can put up and post if you want to have a look at. And it's me in the corner. My corner people are holding my hands above my head, my arms, and trying to get oxygen in my lung to keep me conscious because I'm passing out because I haven't tra- I've only trained three weeks basically really for the fight. I'm like, I'm done. My eyes are closed. I'm like, they're keeping me conscious. And there's a, the picture is my, tr- you see my trainer's finger about one inch away from my chin. And he puts his finger under, his finger under my chin lifted up and goes, look at me. I've never asked anything I'll be in. Win this fight for me. Win this fight for yourself. Win this fight for your family. I just jumped out of the corner, stood up before the round was even over and just gone, you know, yeah, let's go. Over. And then, um, yeah, and five rounds, just won the fight. Jesus. That's crazy. Won the fight. But that's what I mean. That's your purpose. You know what I mean? That's, that's what you got to do. But my point, the, and, and to bring this, because this is, I'm telling my story about fighting, but to bring it back into business and how it works in the real world, you're never justified. If anyone goes, oh, I'm the man, I'm the champion, they're full of shit. It's mentors, it's brothers, it's, it's yeah, the people that are around you that help you with the team. My trainer won me that fight, without a doubt. I was gone. And what he said, he knew what to say and exactly how to get into me because I fight for my family, I fight for my purpose and I fight for him. Mm. And what he gave me was a power that ended up making me not human. You know what I mean? Like it just gave me this, it, it, that, that from that point on, he's fighting my soul. And yeah, it was, it was, it was an incredible fight. It's Kirk and Oscar versus Ian Jacobs, if you want to watch it, guys. It's a, it's a classic. Absolutely, it is and crazy. That, that, and the promoter then, out of that fight, he got Fox Sports. Fox Sports watched that fight and said, we've got to have this. And that's when they first took on full shows of kickboxing in Australia. Wow. But um, yeah, my, my point is, is, is that you've just got to, you know, dedicate and devote. And um, the mentors and, and people in your life, they also help you, not just, not just by yourself. And you become good from learning from your own mistakes, mm. but do great. You've got to be able to learn from others. So when you've got mentors and stuff like that, yeah, you know, family, fight for your family, fight for your purpose, you, you know, work for things and, and, and have a good team that you yeah, trust. Yeah, because I find in, in business, people try to do all that they can to avoid making mistakes and to yeah. avoid but that that's that's the learning curve like that's where yep. you learn your biggest lessons and that's where you have your biggest growth yeah and you know yep. when you relate it back to, to fighting you know when you yep. talk about you know when you're blind in one eye and you know you broke your bones and you're getting back in you're getting up you're experiencing pain and things yeah. you've never experienced before yeah but going back into your next fight you would take another level of experience going into that after having been through that yep that's right. And then, and then to answer your question about um, uh, Manson Gibson, that was the guy you're talking about that was trained by Bruce Lee. The mentee. Yeah, That's mate. crazy. Mate, you, he, you never hear this type was, of shit from anybody. It was, it was um, a crazy fight. I was 22. This is before. So we were rewinding two years before my first world title fight. He was my first world title crack. And we sat at a press conference. He, he has world titles, like eight different world titles, all different martial arts, almost – knocked out every single kickboxing fight. And where one. was this taking place? In Melbourne. In Melbourne? In Melbourne. He's from Chicago. Um, so he's American. He's American, yeah, yeah. dark American. And um, anyway, we had the press conference and um, we're sitting there with, oh, what's his name, Bert, the the big guy, Bert, he's, he's, I think he passed now. Anyway, he, um, he said, how do you think the fight will go? And I said, mate, we're both knockout experts. Whoever stuffs up is going to pay. And he's heard that. 
You know what I mean? Like he's so intelligent. You know, my, my brother always said to me that if someone beats you, they'll be smarter than your brother. And I go, no one's smarter than me in the ring, so that one's not going to happen. Well, you know, they always say there's always someone smarter, always someone, someone better, always someone, someone stronger. Well, he, he was that guy. Anyway, so first round, he's come up to me and we're getting ready for the fight. The belt says, it's my 13th fight too. And he kisses me. <laughs> in the middle of the ring, like kisses me, right? What do you mean he kisses you? He actually kisses me. He like, just walks up and lays one on you. Yeah, like we're uh, bouncing. He's bouncing in front of me and I'm bouncing and then there, he's just grabbing me with his gloves and pulling my head in and just giving me this big kiss. <laughs> and as he's – I've reached out to grab him to headbutt him and, he, and he's, he's like pulled back. And then I've looked down and saw the belt. It's my 13th fight. I'm 22. I'm like, oh, if I, if I fight him now, do I get disqualified? It doesn't happen. And it's exactly what he wanted. My head's just gone into the spin. And I'm just walking like a lion back and forth, ready to kill him. I'm so angry, man. <laughs> you know, like, I'm just like, just breathing, just can't wait for this fight to start. I'm like, gonna, I've turned around, I've realized, because if anyone knows anything about fight, Muhammad Ali, classic, beat most of the biggest world champions, because he'd get him angry. He'd talk to him in the ring and get him angry, yeah. and you lose control, and they knock him out. And I've turned around and I've realized that and I've gone, no, I'm not going to do that. That's what he wants. He wants to do that. So he knocks me out. Anyway, we're having this fight. First round, he's going, you're stuffing up, Ian, you're stuffing up. And, and he's hitting me. Like we'd have this punch up. I'd hit him six times. He'd hit me four. When you're in an experience, you don't know. And he's going, you're stuffing up. So I'm, I go to lose my cool like, like I normally do, like really lose my nut. And I'm like, nut, nut. I backed off. And he's throwing this little jab. Little, in the middle of our big punch combinations where we're nearly killing each other, he's throwing these little little jabby punches and kicks out. Mm. And then um, I'm not even noticing them. And uh, he turns around first round. He doesn't spin him back fist and broke my nose. I remember I felt my nose. Fuck. And it was like feeling my cheek. And it was like someone had a finger in front of my eye. I get back to the corner and my eyes like, shut up, come here. Just crunch, 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 straightens it up. Get out there, do this, oh. do that. So anyway, I've got that. That all happen. And he's gone, oh, you know, and he's talked to me the whole fight. And I get to like the ninth round and I've realized that he's got all these points up. You know what I mean? My trainer's just gone, go, go. And I've I've hit him from rope to rope. I've 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 because he was the reason he said to me afterwards, he goes, Why did I kiss you? And I said, Because you wanted me angry. He goes, No, I wanted you calm. He goes, Very few fighters have what we call focused aggression. And he goes, The more aggressive you get, the more focused you get. I wanted you calm. So by the ninth round, I just couldn't put him away. So he outpointed me. He won the fight. You know, but um, he was trained by, personally by Bruce Lee. He fought every week, every second week for 17 years. He's, he's actually fought fight like every kind of fight you, you can possibly imagine. Wow. He was known as the Thai killer because he was knocking out the top Thai fighters as well. And he's, he's like a Kung Fu based kind of fighter. But anyway, he, he sat down afterwards and he wanted to take me to dinner. He took me to dinner. This is a guy you've just been smashing yeah. to pieces yeah, in the ring. Yeah, yeah, he was, but he, and, and the thing was, he goes, man, I, I picked that knocky out within three rounds. He goes, I need you to come up to the room. I've got something for you. And he calls it his Bible. And it's a book that Bruce Lee personally gave him. It's Jeet Kune Do. It's the most sold martial art book in the world. Yeah, wow. And uh, it's got no covers on it. He goes, I've read this every fight for 17 years. He goes, I did everything here in Mourn. I couldn't beat you. It's yours. And we, wow. nearly, we nearly had a punch up outside his room. I go, mate, I pushed it back to him. I said, I don't want to know your style. I'm going to fight you again. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to beat you. And he goes, mate, I'm never fighting you again. Yeah. I'm never fighting. You know, I know you'll beat me. He goes, wow. I'm never. But I've still got that book at home. G can do. You still got that book at home? Yeah. That's crazy. It's one of my yeah, prized possessions. Um, and, and I've got to ask you too, like, w- would you say that that was your toughest fight or? No, Gurkhan. Gurkhan's gone. Yeah, I was blind for about three weeks afterwards. Wow. I was like, I felt my soul being dragged from my body for about a half an hour after the fight and I knew if I went unconscious, I wasn't coming back. If you watch the fight, you'll see afterwards my face goes blue, red, green, veins sticking out. Like it was like I could feel my – I knew if I went unconscious, I wasn't coming back. Holy shit. It was definitely the hardest fight. Yeah, the Gurkhan's. That was the smartest. It was like – to watch it, it probably doesn't look that much but – We'd make one mistake and he'd see it. Yeah. I'd not, not make it again and vice versa. And at the end, he, at the end of the fight, when I was fighting him, he kept on, there was one mistake he kept on making. I go, I've got him. I set him up and I throw the head kick and he ducked it. I was like, right, he's not getting out of the next one. So I set it up again with a few punch combinations and I pretend it's a head kick and threw it to the body and he ducked that. And I thought, the next one, he can't go any lower than this. He's gone. I've got him. And I threw the combination, pretend to throw a head kick. And I found it as a leg kick and he went right down and put his face on the ground with his hands. <laughs> and so he went under it. I threw it, full sprawl. I threw it that hard I fell over because I thought there's no way he's getting out of this one. Jesus Christ. But he was, um, yeah, very sharp. And, and I mean with, you know, getting to the level that you got to. Yeah. 
you know, you would have had to have gone some pretty rigorous training to become the, the yeah. champ that you were. And, yeah. you know, what, what was your day to day like? And off the back end of that, also when I ask you is how important is routine for, oh. for people that are just starting off in business that are trying to launch, um, you know, a startup yep. with little to no investment and money? Like how important is your day to day uh, routine? It's everything. You know, you've got a, you, you might be gifted, you might have a talent, you might have a new project, but you've got to dedicate yourself way more than you've got to do what everyone else doesn't do. You know, and that's success starts when everyone else stops. And that's one of the biggest lessons I can, I can give anyone. But uh, I'll take it back from day one. Okay. So once I realized I wanted to be a kickbox, it's another story for another day. But once I, I realized at 17, I, I wanted to do this, I, um, I was looking for gyms and everywhere I went, I go to a karate place. They give me, I want to give me a black belt or a brown belt. And then I, I ended up going to this this one with with Wayne Spencer, an old guy that I did Taekwondo when I was a kid. Mm. And man, I walked out with two black eyes, busted in the mouth, nose was out everywhere. And it's like, it's like, oh my God, these guys were playing with me. You know what I mean? Like, oh, wow. and it's like, this is where I want to be. And he goes, five o'clock tomorrow morning. He didn't think I'd show up. Five o'clock tomorrow morning, Ogden Street Park for the sprints. And I'm thinking, this is perfect. This guy's great. I get there and the other guys are doing this massive like, our training set and like really training hard. I did like one twentieth of what they've done, vomiting everywhere. And I remember at the end of the session, he turns around and he goes, right, over here, sit-ups, over there. And it's a green ant's nest. What? It's a green ant's what nest. What do you mean? He's made us do sit-ups in a green ant's nest. He made you sit on a fucking green ant's nest. Do sit-ups, not sit. Do sit-ups on your back and do your sit-ups while you're getting bitten. Why, why did he do that? Was that was that to instill mental toughness? What what was that for? So my trainer, my master trainer, Wayne Spencer, he's a master. He traveled the world trying to fight all different styles and all that sort of stuff. His knowledge is he's the real life Mr. Miyaki. Yep. His concept was if he tortured us, nothing would shock us in the ring. You were asking about what it's like to be a fighter or what it's like. It's traumatic. It's shock. You gotta put someone out of their rhythm. It's the most amount of pain, the shortest possible term, all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and don't take the wrong way, everybody, because fighters are conditioned. Their bone density changes, all that sort of stuff. They're conditioned for that like a football player. But at the same time, it's it's immense sort of stuff. But his whole concept was he didn't train you, he tortured you. And and the training sessions we did, like most people train one hour a day, maybe two. Like we do easy two to four, sometimes even six or eight some days training at a high, super high intensity, super high. Like he... I remember, I think one of my best workouts I ever did, I was giving 12 kilos away to fight an international fighter from America, Ed Bavelock in Melbourne. And um, because of the weight difference, Wayne wanted me strong. And I remember the last session that I did with him, he... Uh, there was two. One of them, which is against everything that science will say, and and that's we run up Mount Glorious, you know, six k's up there is really. I run the six k's, and he turns around and goes, "Too slow. We're doing it again." I thought, mate, because you got to get it under half an hour. Six k's up a mountain is pretty full on, and I thought I blew it. I thought I blew it away, and so we've gone in the bottom. I run it again, and then he's screaming at me. He's going, "Are you serious? We're going to do this all day." Yeah, and, and this is like one week out from the fight. Like it's every every so expert, it, every expert trainer will tell you it's the worst thing you'll possibly do. Yeah, you know what I mean. And so we've done it the third time. So eighteen k's up mountains. Jesus we've Christ. done we've done that. That's one. But the last session I did, we used to do like hundred meter sprints pushing the car. He's got me push the car, sprint it for the hundred meters, and then going around the corner, and then the next corner, the next corner, and I had to sprint pushing this car two k's. <laughs> like it's it that like if anyone understands like you know, CrossFit sort of power, endurance, this is like crazy. But the two things that happen, it's an amazing thing, is when, when I fought this guy, 12 kilos heavier, they're expecting they're going to walk through me. I, I was just so strong in the legs that I walked through him. But there was one round there where I thought we were out there for, because you get time distortion, you get half knocked out, you know. And I thought we were out there for about an hour or two. And it's just so weird that if I hadn't have done those big runs, I would have mentally been prepared to handle that. Mm. Like I, I come back to the corner going, man, what the F's going on? I've been out there for at least an hour. Someone needs to watch the time. He goes, shut up, listen to me, sit down, and then blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, but anyway, so that that's asking the question about what our training was like. Yeah, so it, and how would, I mean, doing everything you've done and, and being a three-time world champion, like how would you say that that's changed your life? Oh, dramatically, mate. And, and that's why I wanted to be world champion, so I had a voice. Yeah, and the weirdest thing is there is no second place in fighting. Mm. If you know, if you don't, if you don't become the world champion, yeah. 
it doesn't give you that voice, but I honestly swear that it, it was the correct decision and I knew it. Um, open stores gives you a voice, gives you a power and, and things like, like my quest was to do something good for the world. So I started a safe program and people listen to you. You mm. know what I mean? People trust. It's like a university degree times 10. And especially like with top end corporate people or people that are super successful, yeah. they can comprehend the devotion to achieve that. Yeah. And they appreciate that. So, you know, like dedicating yourself to anything. So those people that think, oh, I don't need a university degree. I don't need this. I don't need that or whatever. It's a part of your integrity. It's a part of people can see that to succeed, that know what you put into it is the the secret to it not just what you learn from it you know yeah yeah and um with without of that too like you you were saying before um we got on the microphone we were talking backstage you were talking about how you've spent um a bit of time over in dubai yeah what, what, what's um, salam alaikum kefalik alhamdulillah <laughs> <laughs> one more time <laughs> so can just talk about that a bit so how come how come you ended up in Dubai mate I, I got an opportunity over there with a friend of mine and um, it starts with I want to be world champion boxer and then when I saw Bruce Lee I, uh, I saw that and then when I saw kickboxing I investigated into it and thought that I'd do that but uh, I want to be world champion so I could have a voice uh, world champion boxing would have given me a global voice mm-hmm. and given me the money to look after mum and dad and to do the things I want to do for good. Uh, kickboxing didn't. So right. I was I was crushed but at the end of it. I did everything everyone asked to beat everyone and didn't get anything out of it. Ended up in debt. But I ended up getting an opportunity to go to Saudi Arabia, do some bodyguard work and do some other business stuff that was over there and um, just dedicated myself to that and just took my mate's business. We went 50-50 and go in there and, and took it to a whole other level and um, became millionaires out of it, you know, doing that. And that's what gave me the power to, to do other things, yeah. And that was one of my, that was my – I've set three goals in my life. One was to be world champion. The other one was to be a millionaire before 30, which I achieved both of those. And the third one is to make Thunderball the f- biggest, fastest franchise on the planet within five years. And I'm um, talking to um, fitness leaders, like major – corporation fitness leaders nationally internationally that do big franchise fitness organizations and they're coming up this weekend actually to have a look at it and get oh, really? it. they reckon it's the best thing they've seen in 10 years so yeah wow we're really excited so yeah. talk talk a bit about thunderball what, what exactly is thunderball thunderball is a is an uh, a, a first of a martial art inspired ball game mm-hmm. it's absolutely no contact between between players and competitors but to, if you can imagine um uh indoor cricket net that's smaller, a little bit bigger than a squash court with the roof and the walls, a uh, soft martial art ground and then a big exercise ball and you're wearing gloves, punch, kick, elbow, knee the ball yep. to the wall and it changes over. Um, heaps of fun, heaps of focus. Um, you can start off with really easy or you can play it really hard. So anyone at any level can play it. It's the first ever um, sport that everyone can play. Mm. You can be three and muck around with it. You can be six. You can be 60 and have a go. It's all open to all different levels. And it's also the first ever sport where you've got A grade can play two B grade people, an A grade, one A grade person can create three C grade or an A grade against four D grade. So it's really good in the opportunity that you can have corporate performance programs and stuff like that where you get or a few mates and executives that come down and I'm a world champion athlete you can get three or four other guys and girls or whatever that can come in and play the game and because they're everywhere around the court and you, when, you, when you hit the ball, the other person can hit it, they can compete against a world champion and beat me and stuff like that or other athletes or, you know, that sort of thing. It's um, heaps of fun. Stress release is, is exceptional. Yep. And scientifically, it's one of the best workouts you can have. It's the best cardio sort of workout you'll get but because um, uh, it works on spatial awareness which we don't have as we're getting old, you know, and um, it's one of an imperative part of youth. It fires up your nervous system and a safe and controlled environment, which you don't do. You don't do things when you're getting older or anything like that. And uh, it also activates your neuromuscular body connection. So, you know, your body, your core, you know, all that sort of stuff. Mm. And, you know, and like I said, it's um, – uh, we've got games that are social fun branding games. Yep. So you can be a, have a business, come down, network, bring some people down, you know, have a drink upstairs at the bar we're about to put in, you know, and that sort of stuff. Um, or you can be an elite athlete that can come down and, and learn um, how to be a, a super athlete with 
with what it does. Yeah. That's crazy. And it, so um, you, you're hitting a, is it like an inflatable like medicine ball? Like what, what is it? Yeah, it's like a like a Swiss ball, like Swiss an exercise ball, ball yeah. Okay. So, so it's how, soft. How, yeah. how do you score points in the game? Well, if the ball bounces twice before it gets to you, you lose a point. If you hit it and it bounces twice, you lose a point. But if you hit it and it bounces once, it goes to bounce twice, your friend can hit it or you can run up and hit it again. You can hit it off the walls. You can tap it up in the air, keep it off the ground. Um, it's fast, it's furious, it's fun. It's, you know, it's like, yeah, it's really cool. That's, that's and awesome. And where, whereabouts are you located? At Newstead, 75 Longland Street, Newstead. 75 Longland Street, yeah. Newstead. It's Thunder Ball. Thunder Ball. A, T, T-H-U-N-D-A Ball. Cool. So anyone that's wanting to go check out, um, you want to go meet Ian, you can go down to Thunderball at Longland Street there. Yeah. Um, but hey, when it comes to, you're talking about you have some investors coming in here. Mm-hmm. Talk about that. Yeah. For, for people in their business right now that, that don't have a lot of money, yep. they're, they're kind of taking on um, every which job that they can from advertisement to copy to sales yep. and all that. They've got no money on board. They're wearing every hat in the company and in the business. Yep. Um, how yeah. did you go about getting I mean, investors on board? That, and that's the hardest thing when you've got to wear so many hats and dilutes what you really need to do. Yeah. So one of the biggest things I learned about business was like I learned to read when I left high school. So not the smartest tool in the shed. Experience-wise, extremely intelligent, creative, absolute genius, working out problems, problem solving, really even more of a genius at that than I am at anything else. But it's finding people who are smarter to do the things that you can't. Yep. You know, one of the biggest successes. And that's where it's really hard for people that um, have got to wear all multiple hats. Mm. You know, when you haven't got the money to do that, they're the hard years, but you just never give up. Never give up, man. Think of, if you want some, someone inspired, think of me breaking my arms, my legs, you just never give up. Don't stop. Yeah. You know what I mean? Success starts where everyone else stops. And that's what I'll say, you know, and, it, and it's so true. If you really believe in something, if you desire it, don't give up, it'll work. You've been listening to part one with three-time world champion kickboxer Ian Jacobs. Please go onto our website or any podcast platform to listen to part two. And again, thank you for listening to Make Shit Happen. Thank you for listening. Hopefully you've learned something from today's episode and know the next steps to focus on in your business. Want more resources to jumpstart your journey? Click the link in the show notes to see what else I have to offer and book a call with myself to jumpstart your business and make shit happen. I specialize in helping people turn their passion into six-figure businesses to replace your nine-to-five through online education and high-ticket coaching. If this is something that interests you, you can reach out to me through any of my social media outlets in the description below.